very glad to be back here after a few uh, years of absence. Um, we're going to walk you through a, a use case, a rather practical use case around how we have been able to um, achieve a wonderful marriage between numbers of different technologies here at, at Swedbank, uh, centered around the cloud. So uh, without further ado, uh, my name is Nimar Gubani. I'm heading the technology development at, at what we call anti-financial crime. Um, and, and this is our journey going forward. So uh, a few words about Swedbank here. Yeah. Um, I think most of you know about Swedbank, one of the largest Nordic uh, institution, financial institutions uh, with an extensive footprint, of course, in Sweden, but also in the Baltic countries. Uh, a universal bank in the sense that we provide a broad set of products and services. A multi-channel company uh, with strong footprint in digital channels, of course, and, and of course, um, significant branch presence. Um, we will talk more now around a, an area of investment advice. Um, savings uh, and, and investments is, of course, a very integral part of any sort of a banking product and a core component in every um, part of our, our customer's life. Um, so we pride ourselves by being able to provide uh, high quality advice to our customers around the savings in the savings area uh, and of course it's also a central product uh, in our portfolio uh, with the share size of, of, of our, our customer base we do some around 10 probably 10 thousands of, of, of uh, face to face meetings um, these days also virtual meetings uh, where we provide then advice to our customers around various types of savings product. Uh, not only is providing a high quality advice a, a regulatory requirement, and we're being followed up on that, but the fact is also that uh, it's a competitive advantage uh, to be able to uh, provide advice that helps move forward the customer's financial life, as it has significant impacts on, on, uh, on each one of our lives. But it's also an extremely complex pro uh, process. It uh, requires a lot of um, different types of interactions and, and interfaces. Uh, it, as, as from that perspective, also a lot of different control points are introduced in this process. And hence also it makes a really nice use case when it comes to automating um, uh, using new technologies. And that's sort of say, the starting point for our journey. Um, Manual controls, an uh, important part of the, the way we make sure that we are compliant and, and uh, provide qualitative advice. However, we are only able to cover a small fraction of all the thousands of thousands of advisory uh, sessions that we uh, conclude each year, month, and year. And the key challenges we see in this area is that, of course, we need to enhance our control coverage. We need to be able to uh, provide feedback to our advisors. Uh, in a larger scale. Uh, there is today a, a gap, between, a time gap between the time we actually conclude the advisory sessions and, and when we provide the controls and actually giving feedback to, uh, to the advisors. As the process is very manual, there you introduce human errors. Um, there is, of course, a lot of sensitive information discussed and, and shared, and, and there is a, a potential risk of exposure for human lives when made throughout this process. Uh, and, of course, the way we have set this up previously, it, it, it leaves a lot of room for improvements, and, and we simply can say that the controls are not granular enough, as it looks like today. So then what, is the, what has been the, 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 uh, the next step, and what are the things that we're trying to then automate? Uh, we aim to, of course, increase the coverage. Uh, there are regulatory requirements around how much you should be able to coverage uh, around the control parts. Uh, we want to be able to, of course, provide ultimately an instant feedback to our advisors. Uh, so we want to reduce that time lag and we want to have more uh, frequent uh, feedback loops. Uh, we want to avoid human errors uh, to the extent possible and, and of course reduce the exposures. At the end of the day, we believe that increased automation and then combining things like cloud and AI, as we will look into that later on, will provide us a greater granularity and ability to deep dive further than we do today. There you go, Simon. Thank you, um, so I'm just going to go through a bit more about the um, template and why it's so necessary to actually um, automate some of this. So our old template, as you can see, has um, seven control points. What we want 
to aim for is one with roughly 30 plus control points. Now, if we're thinking about what that means from a business perspective, we're faced with a choice if we're continuing the same level of manual control. We take roughly, what we either look at one fifth of the documents manually, which isn't acceptable, or we um, have to automate it in some way and speed things up, or we spend lots of money on FTEs. So, um, Originally, we were looking at manual controls. Our plan is to move this forward and take um, two approaches for looking at our, on our new template in automation. The first um, set of um, controls are ones that are going to be run by our robotic, robotic process automation team. Okay? And then the more complicated controls are going to be run by um, our AI solution. Now, in terms of how we're going to do that, it's good to have an idea of what these actual control points might look like. It's, um, so if we're thinking about RPA, RPA is a robot. It's able to handle relatively simple things. So if we are looking for, say, the customer's birth date, we know where that's going to fall within the um, investment advice. Um, and the robot can pull it out, check there's a valid birth date. Uh, we can also check um, whether the customer has assets within the bank. Does the customer have a risk profile? Again, all very, very straightforward things. AI controls come in where we're looking for something a little bit more sophisticated. You can't just do with a very, very simple regex or kind of uh, that kind of approach. So is the purpose of our savings goal clear? It's, uh, does the time horizon match the name of the saving goal? So it's, uh, for example, if I'm, um, I don't know, I'm saving for uh, my retirement, yet my kind of saving product is given me with kind of a one or two year um, horizon, that doesn't fit. What I want is a long term um, product. And has the advisor given recommendation on change of funds? So we need to know whether the advisor is actually telling someone to make an active change or not as one of our controls. So given this information, you kind of, um, we know we've got robotics. We know we've got some AI. Let's have a quick think about what the kind of solution looks like here. Now, um, this is a very, very overly simplified version of what it's going to be. But what you can imagine, we've got some electric, electronic document that's going to represent all of the information that's given to the client. Um, the robot's going to pick that up. And then it's going to process its um, checkpoints. That's fine. Now, of, of the other checkpoints, what it's going to do is extract some text from that document and send them over to the cloud solution. So we're not sending over the whole document. We're just sending part of the document at a time to kind of get the feedback on a checkpoint by checkpoint basis. And then at the end, the robot kind of collates everything and puts it back together and passes it along to um, the people that need to receive it and pass the feedback on to the advisors. So another way of phrasing this is basically the robot's doing the hard lifting here in terms of integration. It's we can make this simple for ourselves. Ultimately, we, what we want to do is expose a RESTful API that the robot calls into in some way and returns whether checkpoints have passed or failed. OK, um, it sounds simple, but now you need to think kind of this is a bank. This is a core product in a bank. This is a complicated thing to deliver here. We've got a lot of different parties involved. And we need to have them actively working together um, to be able to achieve this. So we've got kind of the savings experts. We've got the back office people who are kind of actually having to look at these things manually in the first place. We need their, their expertise to check we're doing it correctly. We've got the data science team, which is where I sit. Um, we've got the cloud team. who. I'm advertising because they're so great. Um, we've got the robotic process automation team, and we've got the advisors themselves. So this is a big cross-functional, complex co cross-functional team. And these projects are only possible because of the way we're working within that team. It's, we're not saying we're sitting in one meeting kind of once a week or once every two weeks with all of these people, and we say, yeah, is everything OK? Yeah, everything's fine. Thank you. No, we're sitting down coding, the data science team sitting down a couple of days at a time with the cloud team to deliver on the bits of the cloud solution. Data science team sitting down with the back office people to check that our kind of approaches are giving them the results that they need to get. So this is actually really kind of very, very truly cross-functional. Um, I'll also dwell a little bit on the kind of solution in terms of the web architecture. It's a simple solution. All we're really doing is exposing an API. And it's going to run something in a container that has some models involved, and it's going to return something. Now, the interesting bits about this, in many ways, is the way we're actually going about trying to build this. We're not building this one off. We want to build this to be a reusable unit. So there's lots and lots of cases within the um, bank where we're going to want to be able to process documents in some way. So what we want to be able to do is pick this up, use it again, where all we have to change is the business logic inside. We don't want to have to change all of the kind of infrastructure. So we've been basically using infrastructure as code using Terraform templates. So all of our DevOps pipelines build the whole thing, deploy it, 
and it runs, and we know what we're getting. Uh, another important consideration is, well, we're a bank, we have to be very, very secure. So as you probably noticed there, there's nothing really discussing about how we're keeping this secure. Uh, I'll dwell on a little bit about that here. We're taking two main approaches. So you probably saw in terms of passing segments of text. When the robot passes those segments of text, we're trying to be careful. What we're doing is, um, I'm sorry, this one seems to have uh, formatted slightly incorrectly here, but uh, what we're doing is wherever possible, we search automatically when we can regex it out, remove it, just look at, find an entity, replace it with a token. So wherever possible, no sensitive information is passed through the API. Occasionally, something will get passed. OK, yeah, the regex would catch this, but you could imagine lots of cases where something might get through. What we can do in the AI solution, then, is catch that and flag it so it doesn't happen again. We kind of give that feedback information to the uh, robot. So we kind of ongoing um, monitoring whether this uh, personally identifiable information, PII, gets through. So we're stopping as much information going up that um, has a privacy risk associated going to the cloud. Now we also want to kind of have a think, well, how can we make this secure all the way through? And again, taking this approach of kind of um, using infrastructure as code, how do we make this so it's completely repeatable? So again, exploiting a Dev, uh, DevSecOps type approach. At the code level, we're um, linting, we're type checking to make sure everything is we're expecting. We're doing unit tests and regression tests. I'll dwell a little bit on how, with something like this, that unit tests can, or regression tests can be extremely useful. We have checkpoints. We've validated these with users. So our unit, our kind of regression tests aren't just kind of like your classic software engineering regression tests. Our regression tests are basically telling our um, uh, our teams, the, whoever's going to approve this to go into production, whether we're actually catching the checkpoints we're meant to be capturing. So this is absolutely explicit descriptions of what we're trying to capture built within the DevOps pipeline. And we've also got um, scanning of dead code. Uh, and from the security perspective, we're kind of taking multiple levels here. We're kind of um, looking for vulnerabilities in the packages we're using. So you probably can tell we're using um, Python. Um, so we've got Bandit and um, other uh, uh, security scanners there. We've got Terraform security scanners as well, because we're using uh, another um, technology. We need to make, make sure we're doing it in the safest possible way. And then finally, we're doing um, both passive and active penetration testing using OASP. Um, these all coded in automatically, running regularly. Whenever you do um, a pull request, all of this is checked. We know we're secure all the way through. And I'll pass back to Nima at this point to talk about the outcome. So to the fun part, though, and, and what did we able, be able to achieve? Uh, of course, putting uh, this into production requires a, a rigid testing and validations, as this is, of course, a very highly uh, regulatory uh, controlled process. So in order to uh, satisfy the stakeholders, we've conducted a number of very rigid testings. And, and the, the, the graph here shows the sort of the consistency that we've been able to achieve comparing this to the manual controls. And, and the numbers are fairly high. And we feel confident that I think we set the threshold somewhere above 75. And I think we've been achieving most of that. There are still controls like the one you see on point 6, point 10. Uh, where you see that, that that particular control is very nuanced and, and, and it's quite complex. So there we are still having a lot of work to do to sort of boost up the AI to be able to reach the, the uh, threshold values to be able to um, put this into production. But but all in all, uh, in in you know less than a couple of less than a quarter, I think we will be able to to. Uh, improve the control coverage, which is one of the sort of regulatory requirements that we need to adhere, by two digit, two digit improvements. And, and, and considering that you know, this process then expands across the entire bank for a, a significant portion of our, our revenues, so that's, I think it's, uh, it's been uh, a success so far. Um, then, of course, what is then around the corner? What's the next steps around? And there's a number of questions that we raise here, and we would like to sort of dip, uh, dig into going forward. Um, one of the things is, of course, that these uh, control frameworks, these uh, templates might change over time. So we need to have a rigid process around how we govern those changes. Because if you change the control mechanisms, of course, you also need to change the, the subsequent AI solution. And that, uh, that sort of flexibility, but also that control needs to be formalized and, so, and governed in the proper way. So that's the work we have ahead of us. 
Uh, there's also a fact that you know we want to have a ground truth, a, a, a set of um, baseline that we compare, of course, all the AI models towards, and those are the the, the humans that have rated some of these documents and controls, and, and of course humans can make mistakes. So, so here we also need to make sure that uh, our comparison base is, 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 uh, is solid uh, and we can trust our numbers going forward. So here's also a bit of work that relates to the governance part. Um, but I think the, probably the most important part here is, is at, le at least for me, is to be, if, be able to, to continuously improve the feedback loop and, and make that feedback loop as, as instant as possible. That is uh, much um, um, simpler said than done, obviously, considering the different types of complex uh, components that are involved here. Um, and I think going forward, I think we will need to put a lot of effort into integrating various types of AI, API con configurations and API integrations into this process to make it even further uh, seamless. Uh, and, and trying to shift the balance from this little bit of still of a reactive control into being more preventive error. So ideally, as the point at the point in time where the advisors actually in front of a customer is, is, is compiling and finalizing these controls, uh, and in the advisory session, we want to be able to just before the just before, so say the the advisor presses the submit button, we want to be able to provide the feedback uh, as soon as possible to the advisor and uh, to to help that advisor in that particular session to improve or or even correct some of the mistakes that has been in the control. So that sort of division uh, right now there is still. Um, um, semi -co semi components in this process that that prevents us from taking it all the way, but I think that would be a little bit of the sort of wanted position that we aim for going forward. So, um, so I think this has been a success factor from many different aspects, but but uh, primarily from the time that that um, one literally from the idea origination to the implementation in in uh, in production. Um, it took probably you know less than a quarter, uh, and it was all enabled by the fact that we decided to kind of um, let's go off our old truth and, and start embracing the new technologies. And cloud was sort of the driver, and, and it still is, and will be an important part of our journey going forward. And, and sort of thing, opening up the cloud journey allowed us then to also explore other new technologies and be able to sort of say either repurpose the stuff we have today, but also being able to integrate it in a much better way. The cross-functional teams this has been already mentioned before as a success factors, and I think here again is important to emphasize that we really try to look at the core strength and, and the, the value that each of the members brought to the table, and, and, and I think somehow when you find that magic combination, it, 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 it is an automatic um, flow that you don't really need to get intervened to. So that work has been a, a significant improvement and a significant part of our success. But I think also from a design perspective, we really uh, early on agreed on that we need to try to automate as much as possible. And, and here you have access to a lot of different technologies enabled by the cloud, uh, CI, CDs. Um, and and maybe really making sure that you know, either you can reuse the stuff you have and integrate that in a seamless way using infrastructure as a code or APIs, but also really making sure that all of those integrations are, are from the beginning automated and, and simplified. So a, a lot of different things, of course, has played into this, but I would still kind of want to um, bring forward the human factors, the fact that we were able to bring a lot of smart people into the same room and, and really make things work together. So that has been, um, that I would say, is something that we will take with us going um, in this journey. I think that's it from us.